All right. Uh, hello. Oops. Um, uh, that Mark Rand and me uh, have been working on. Uh, I'll start by talking about some fancy uh, ways in which you could uh, potentially extend RCU uh, as kind of a mental stepping stone. Um, and then I'll uh, go into uh, the actual mitigation stuff. So um, the motivation, um, why I think that a use of mitigation uh, is, is important, uh, the, the design uh, we came up with, some of the pitfalls and limitations of the current design, and uh, then in the end, uh, some performance numbers and aspirational ideas for long-term development. Um, so this is just like meant as a mental stepping stone. It's not necessarily something you should actually uh, be implementing. Some of this is maybe not a great idea. So when you're working with RCU, you often have the scenario, um, you're holding an, you're inside an RCU reset critical section and you're holding an RCU reference to some object. Uh, and now you want to call something like kmalloc, um, but you can't do that because kmalloc can block. Uh, and there are some classic options for dealing with this uh, kind of scenario. For example, you can make a retry loop around RCUD reference and ref count increment not zero, uh, or you can do some optimistic GFP no way path and then have a separate slow path. But all this is kind of ugly because you need to code extra um, slow paths uh, for this stuff. Um, so it would be kind of nice uh, if we could instead just uh, unconditionally increment the ref count on the object uh, when we know that we're about to block uh, and then terminate the RC reset critical section and then after the blocking operation, start a new RC reset critical section uh, and decrement the ref count again and then we're back in the original context. Um, so for this, we need some ref counting API um, that allows us to um, uh, to increment the ref count after it's already uh, dropped to zero. Um, and the ref counting API must basically guarantee that an object only gets treat of this ref count has been zero for an entire RCU grace period. And we can um, provide semantics like that uh, on top of RCU head relatively easily. Um, so basically what we want is we have, we have this ref count, uh, which initially starts with uh, as, uh, as a non -zero, a zero value. Then at some point the ref count drops to zero, at which point we schedule the RCU head. Uh, if the object stays at ref count zero, we uh, eventually get the RCU callback and then we can free the object. Uh, but if the ref count is incremented back up from zero at some point in the meantime, uh, we need to cancel the RCU head basically to get back to our initial state. Except RCU heads can't be canceled because they're on a singly linked list and stuff. Um, so you, you can't just remove things from the middle of a singly linked list. So instead, we need to um, keep track of whether uh, this has happened. So we have an extra state bit in the object that says whether the object has been resurrected, uh, meaning that uh, um, it, it has come back up from ref count zero. And then if so, we um, wait for the next RCU callback to occur and um, discard that uh, callback. Uh, and then uh, if we are at ref count zero, we schedule another as you, um, uh, uh, we schedule the as you had again. And then if we get a callback, we know that we can actually free the object. Uh, now, when you're, when you're looking at the, at the code we have now, I think it looks kind of nicer, but there's still a small potential issue, uh, which is that if, if, if you have a K-malloc invocation like this, it's usually not going to block. It, it may block and we have to um, write code that can tolerate that, but usually it won't. Um, and if we are unconditionally always around the KMLOG doing this um, ref count increment and decrement stuff, that's potentially going to cause like cache line contention stuff. Um, so it would be kind of nice if we could avoid that uh, without uh, coding an extra GF GFP no way path or anything like that. Um, and I think that is theoretically possible. I'm not saying that this is a great idea, but just as a mental stepping stone, um, we could basically reuse the idea of preemption notifiers. Um, so we for this, we would have to change RCU, uh, the RCU core to support this use case. And basically the idea would be that instead of um, lifting the ref count up before the KMLOG, you just register, uh, you just have um, a little um, RCU pin data structure on your stack um, in which you register that you are currently using uh, this object foo. Um, and then you put this um, object on a linked list that hangs off of the task truck or something like that. Um, and then you tell the RCU subsystem, okay, from now on it's okay to get preempted. And then if you actually get preempted, the RCU, uh, the RCU um, stuff that's happening inside the uh, scheduler could walk through the single leading list uh, that hangs off the task and lift up the ref counts of, of all the objects before terminating the RCU read cycle over section. Uh, and then after you're done with uh, the blocking operation, uh, you could um, revert all the state. Um, so 
yeah, this just like as a mental stepping stone, keep this in mind for the rest of the talk. And now let's switch to something completely different and start with the motivation of uh, why I think um, uh, and start with the motivation uh, why I think uh, that use after free mitigation makes sense. So um, if if you're thinking about um, security of, about bugs in like a security context, you can kind of categorize them in, into bugs with a with that have locally scoped impact, which security people tend to call like lo logic bugs and bugs that have more of a global impact, like for example, memory corruption. So we've had lo local bugs, like for example, uh, in the BFS code, there were some uh, missing uh, uh, checks uh, in the path traversal code where you could have um, a bad interaction with renaming that would allow someone to path traverse out of a container. Um, or in ptrace, we've had uh, bugs in like the ptrace trace me checks, for example, that would allow you to um, get access to a privileged process. Now these these are pretty severe bugs, but uh, they they have a li and they have an impact that is fundamentally limited uh, by the importance of the subsystem they're in, um, and, and and that means that you can potentially find these issues. But on the other hand, we have bugs with global impact um, that are just memory corruption. Um, like, for example, in the Putex code, there was some code that used iGet to take a reference on an inode, except you're not allowed to do that, and then that leads to use of the freeze. Uh, or we've had, we've had missing locking uh, in the um, core dumping path that could then raise with user fault FD operations. Um, and, and so these have impact that just um, affects the entire call independent of how important the subsystem actually is. Um, and if we're comparing performance issues with uh, security issues, I think that performance issues are pretty great. Like uh, performance issues, you tend to notice if you have them. Um, if uh, you have, uh, if, if you notice that you have a performance issue, you can run profiling to kind of try to figure out where they are. Um, and if a code base has not been optimized a lot yet, you might be able to get some pretty large performance wins using, using relatively small uh, optimizations. On the other hand, security issues uh, tend to be uh, invisible in many cases, um, and they can hide almost anywhere in your code base, as we've seen on the last slide. So I think that maybe it would be good, a good idea if we could turn security issues into performance issues, as long as we preserve these nice properties of performance issues that you can actually like fix the performance uh, impact without um, crippling functionality. Um, so. If we're talking about use of freeze, I guess we need to have like a simple example of what we're actually trying to mitigate. So here's a simple pattern of what a use of the free um, kernel exploit might look like. Uh, so the scenario is um, we have an object A that we can um, ac uh, of which we can access a member after the object has already been freed. Um, we can write uh, an arbitrary value into this member. So as an attacker, we need to um, first allocate um, this object A, then um, get this object A to be freed again. Uh, and then we'll want to um, allocate a new object B at the old address of A, um, and we'll want to choose this object uh, B such um, such that uh, it has a member um, that uh, it has an interesting member that overlaps with the member we can write through. So, for example, we can choose an object B that has a function point at the same offset. Uh, then uh, we can choose something like a, a pointer to some gadget and, and some interesting gadget and kernel code. Um, and then write this pointer through the dangling uh, pointer A, and thereby corrupt the function pointer in B, and then we trigger a, a call um, through this function pointer in B, and we get kernel instruction pointer control. Um, now, we have a, a bunch of mitigations and such in the kernel that can kind of make an attack like this um, harder. Um, so, for example, we have attack stops reduction, like a, a second but in Linux, um, which prevents you from being able to allocate this object A in the first place. Um, so. If, if that can block the, uh, such an attack, that's pretty great. Um, after that, um, we have the step where the attacker needs to allocate an object B at the old address of A, and we have uh, mitigations like, for example, in newer ARM64 hardware, there's going to be memory tagging, which kind of makes it hard uh, to get the object B to, to be allocated at exactly the same address as A. Then we have the step where we have to choose uh, a, a, the type of object B, such that we have overlapping members, um, and struct randomization makes this really painful. Um, then we have a KSR, which kind of tries to protect uh, against um, against us being able to choose a pointer to a gadget in kernel code. Um, and then at the end, we have the step where we are uh, triggering a call through this control function pointer, and then we have CFIS mitigation that tries to uh, stop us from doing that. 
Now, uh, CFI is not something an attacker actually has to necessarily deal with for an attack like this, um, because the attacker can, instead of targeting a gadget in, in kernel code, in, instead of targeting a, a function pointer in structure B, uh, the attacker could choose a different structure B uh, that has a pointer to some data buffer in the same place. Um, and then uh, the attacker could, uh, instead of triggering a function call through this member of B, uh, trigger like reads and writes uh, that treat it as an opaque data buffer or something like that. Um, and that would uh, mostly be like similarly bad. Um, and if we're looking at all of the uh, remaining mitigations that we have here, um, apart from the attack service uh, reduction stuff, all of this is more or less probabilistic. Now there are different degrees of like probabilistic protection here. For example, memory tagging is relatively um, makes it relatively hard to figure out the information that you need in order to break the mitigation, like much harder than, for example, KASLR. Um, and struct randomization, probably even if you can leak um, the randomization, it's still going to be a pain to actually exploit. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, all of this is basically probabilistic. Uh, so I think when when trying to mitigate uh, security bugs, it would be a good idea to have the mitigation as close to the actual bug as possible. Um, so partly because as we've seen uh, with CFI, if the mitigation is too far removed from the actual bug, an attacker can potentially just choose a different path of exploitation that bypasses the mitigation. Um, and partly because uh, if we have the mitigation sufficiently close to the bugs, maybe that makes it easier to do performance optimizations at a later point uh, that uh, allow us to get rid of the mitigation overhead um, if we fix specific um, localized uh, issues in code. Um, so it would be great if we could just mitigate the actual bugs like reference counting issues, locking issues and such that lead to use of the freeze. Um, but that's really hard or even feasible to do in like normal C code if you don't have a lot of annotations that tell you what's actually going on. Um, so instead, we have to mitigate uh, the immediate symptom instead, um, which is that we have a memory access through dangling pointer to memory that has been reused in the meantime. Now, I, I'm not saying use after freeze, like using memory after it has been freed, because um, from a security perspective, memory before it has been freed and after it has been freed isn't really all that different as long as the implementation doesn't put internal information uh, into the freed memory. Um, but only when the allocation has been reused, uh, we get this effect where, you, where the use after free access um, causes a data to be uh, corrupted or interpreted incorrectly. Um, and my design goal here is to um, try to provide a deterministic protection uh, in software against um, use of the reallocation uh, with the target environment kind of being desktop x86 systems. Now, um, the, the basic design that many use after free mitigations, like for example, hardware ASAN and memory taking use, uh, are fat pointers. So the basic idea here is that instead of just having a native, uh, a pointer being uh, a linear address, we put some extra information to the pointer that can be used uh, to detect use of the freeze. So the, the, the simple version that, for example, hardware ASAN and memory taking do is we put an additional little cookie in the pointer, and then we put um, cookies on chunks of memory, and when, whenever the user Whenever the code tries to access the pointer, we check whether the cookie in the pointer matches the cookie on the memory, and if not, we crash. Um, a difference is that, uh, an important difference is the hardware ASAN memory time use the, these cookies for probabilistic um, protection. Um, I would like something that can actually also use provide deterministic protection. Um, fat pointers sound as if the pointers get bigger, and in some designs that's the case, but I think we really should strive to have a design where pointers stay the same size. Uh, because otherwise lockless pointer updates get much harder and we risk uh, turning existing data races into like pointer tearing issues that gets complicated. Um, and also we'd just be using much more memory if our pointers were bigger. Um, so just like hardware ASAN and memory tagging and so on, our fat pointers would still fit into 64 bits. Um, now, when you're looking at a bit of code like this and think about how we would have to instrument that, we have this uh, pointer argument here. Um, and then inside this function, we have uh, three accesses to the pointer. Um, and so the, the like trivial uh, implementation of uh, such a mitigation would be that every time we have a memory access like this, uh, we perform an app. We, we perform uh, some access check. So like the, that would look like this. Um, the issue with this is that every time we do a check, we have some overhead for the check. Um, so it would be kind of nice if we could avoid that. So. It would be nice if we could just at the start of the function uh, do a check to verify that the pointer is still live and then inside the function 
uh, just keep using this uh, decoded uh, raw pointer that this operation provides us. Um, unfortunately, this kind of breaks apart if this kind of um, introduces race conditions. Uh, like for example, if the uh, if this other function that we're calling here decides to block um, and or even decides to free the pointer that we're using, um, then the access below that in the loop uh, is going to access a free pointer, uh, and the check that we did before um, doesn't help us. Uh, so what we can do is to go back to this idea that I introduced with RCU uh, earlier. Um, we uh, keep track of all of the objects that any given task is currently using on its stack by having these pin data structures uh, in the stack frames and uh, let, uh, letting them form a linked list that hangs off the task struct or something like that. Um, so, uh, and so then uh, if we use RCU like um, delayed freeing, uh, we can make sure that nobody's actually referencing the object anymore. Uh, and we can optimize this a little bit instead of having a single uh, pin structure on the stack for every object we're accessing, we can have one pin structure per frame that contains an array of these uh, object pointers. Um, instead of access using a variable inside current, we can use the per CPU variable and then switch it on a task uh, switch, just like a stack protector does it, for, exa for example. Um, I was initially considering using org unwinding instead of using this linked list scheme. Um, so just using the normal exception unwinding infrastructure um, and then having some extra information in the unwinding metadata uh, that tells us um, where these uh, pins are located. Um, but that's kind of difficult uh, because you get problems anytime the unwinding is unreliable. Uh, it gets more complex because you need all this infrastructure with the exception unwinding and you need to do stuff like org unwinding under the Rhine log, which is really not pretty. So with this, with this design, we're doing these like object level checks um, where instead of checking every single access, we're just uh, checking once um, we're just doing one check per object that we're referencing in a function. Um, so, and we also need some storage for these reference counts that we need for this RCU-like um, uh, ref counting scheme. Um, so it would really be a, a good fit if we could have some um, per object metadata structure instead of um, tagging like fixed size chunks of memory. Um, now, uh, the most straightforward way you could uh, design this uh, would be to make the fat pointers look like this. Uh, instead of having a linear address uh, in the bottom half of the pointer, uh, you'd have a base pointer that um, points to uh, the head of an allocation memory, uh, and then you'd have an offset inside the pointer that tells you where inside that allocation the pointer is actually pointing. So then uh, you can you can you can find the base uh, you can find the metadata using just the base pointer and find the actual data as base pointer plus offset. And, but this comes with some issues. Uh, uh, for example, uh, if you if you turn a linear address into base pointer plus offset, you need more space for that. Um, so you, the the bits and the pointer get uh, kind of scarce, um, and you can also get into difficult difficulty if you want to reuse physical memory for other things. So, for example, if you want to take a page that used to be a slug page and now use it as an anonymous anonymous page for user space, um, suddenly your metadata, the memory that used to store me uh, metadata. Uh, is now uh, user space memory, and if you get a user software free access, um, the metadata checks won't be performed against user space memory, so that's bad. Um, so uh, instead, I decide, decided to go with a design where instead of um, physical, instead of storing uh, base addresses, we store object indices that then index through a metadata table. Um, so this has the advantage that we have much denser identifier space, and we have more space in our pointers that way. Um, and it means that we uh, we can much easier reuse physical memory for other purposes. Um, and it means that if you run out of um, possible cookies, like we have the 16-bit cookie field on the pointer, and we've um, used all of the 16 possible cookies, and we don't want to reuse them because we want deterministic protection, uh, then we can just use a different metadata table entry with a different object identifier to refer to the same physical memory again, um, and uh, we just waste a little bit of uh, metadata memory and not much else. The big disadvantage of this is that it comes with extra memory and direction. Um, so especially if you have something like a pointer chase, uh, this might double the latency um, caused by memory accesses. Um, to integrate this uh, scheme with the slab allocator, um, we can make use of the fact that in struct page, we still have a 32 bits free um, for uh, pages that belong to the slab allocator. Um, and for every um, slab, for every page that's used by the slab allocator, we can reserve a corresponding contiguous chunk of entries in the metadata table. 
And then this, those three 32 bits and the struct page can be used to refer to the starting index in the metadata table. So then, uh, we can, we can go from the struct page uh, to the metadata table using this field. We can go from the metadata table through the, um, actual data that it refers to and uh, using the raw pointer thought inside the table. And we can go back uh, from, uh, the, from the raw address, uh, to the struct page using go to head page as normal. And then if we um, run out of possible cookies um, for uh, one of the entries in the metadata table, so if the cookie is depleted, uh, we can um, start using, we can point the metadata table entry to a different place in the metadata table, a, a fallback entry, uh, and then uh, just use the index of the fallback entry in our pointers instead. Uh, so with this, with this scheme, we can kind of split the metadata identifier space into um, two to the 30 normal entries and two to the 30 uh, entries just for this fallback stuff. Um, so that gives us enough normal entries to handle either like about eight gigabytes of camera log eight allocations. You usually don't have a lot of those anyway. Um, or something like 440 gigabytes of buffer allocations, which are much more frequent. Uh, so I think this is fine. Um, the tricky part of the fallback entries, because every time you've, um, done allocation and freeing, uh, two to the 16 times, you have to, um, throw away one of the fallback identifiers, uh, and you waste the 16 bytes of memory that it used. Uh, and if you repeat this two to the 30 times, which is the number of fallback entries you have, um, then you, uh, completely exhaust the fallback identifier space. So that's after two to the 46 allocator calls. So even in a very pessimistic example, if you're like allocating every hundred cycles on a two gigahertz CPU, that would still give you enough identifier space for 40 days. So I think that's completely sufficient. Um, the slightly bigger problem is that you're actually leaking memory with this. So every allocation basically leaks two to the minus 12 bytes. Um, in a, in this pessimistic example, you'd be leaking something like 402 megabytes per day. Um, I think that's not really a problem on desktop systems because in practice they perform allocations at like orders of magnitude lower rates. Um, but if you think that this actually is a problem, there are some bonus slides that I won't be able to fit into this time slot that describe uh, how you can kind of uh, work around that problem. Um, uh, this is a terrible slide. I would have replaced it if I still could replace the slides. But um, basically, as I've said, we need to perform um, RCU-based um, we, we need to, because we're using this RCU-like um, uh, scheme for tracking which things we're accessing, we also need an RCU-like scheme for freeing allocations. And RCU always uh, involves this like global synchronization uh, stuff where all of the other CPUs have to check in and say, okay, I'm not using anything anymore. I'm not in a grace period or stuff like that. Uh, so that kind of introduces uh, overhead that we don't want. And there's an optimization we can do, um, which is that uh, when we allocate an object, we can store in the object's metadata on which CPU we did the allocation, then every time we access the object, we can uh, um, check whether the current CPU matches the CPU on which the object was allocated. And if not, we wipe this a number from the metadata. And then when we're freeing an object and we see that it still has a CPU number associated with it, and that is the number of the current CPU, then we can accelerate the freeing because we know that only this current CPU can be using uh, the object. No other CPU can currently be using it. Um, so, Here's an, an, a slide state diagram of what this um, delay freeing machinery um, would look like. So initially you have an allocated uh, object on the left side, then the user invokes a K free. Um, and at that point uh, we go into the rest of the machinery. So if the object has a ref count that's non-zero, we just put the object into floating state, which means it's not on any freeing queues. It's um, still being referenced by an inactive task. And when the ref count of the uh, object drops down to zero, uh, we put the object onto the uh, per CPU queue. Um, and um, once an object is on a queue, even as the ref count goes back up from zero, we don't um, remove it from the queue because just like in the RCU case, we just have a single linked list. Uh, we can't remove things from the uh, from a queue um, without processing the entire queue. Uh, so when we're then doing our uh, local um, free list processing, uh, we can go through our um, per CPU queue. And um, for anything that has a ref count that's bigger than zero, we put it back into floating state. Then if the ref count is zero and it has only ever been accessed from the local CPU, we can free it directly, which hopefully happens in most of the cases. Um, and then um, if uh, in, in all other cases, we need to move the object over onto the global um, queue. Then um, we kind of keep track of how many things are on the global queue. And if we've accumulated a bunch of objects, um, we um, kick off uh, a global synchronization. So at the start of this, we move all of the things that are in new state on the global queue, 
over into old state. Um, and then uh, we ask all of the CPUs to please check in uh, and uh, tell us that they have at least once turned all of their um, live references into ref counted references and back. And whenever an object um, has its ref count elevated back from zero, this um, old flag gets turned back into a new flag. And then once all of the CPUs have uh, checked in, um, we can uh, kick off the global global queue processing where anything that is still in old state uh, with refcon zero uh, can actually be freed. Right. Um, one one thing that's kind of tricky is if we have code that looks like this, where we have um, here we have a pointer argument, but the pointer argument is not always accessed by the function. Only if we're actually accessing this loop. So if we have a count parameter that is non-zero, uh, so we we could if we if we put the, the the access check at the start of the function, then if someone supplies us with a bogus pointer, but the count zero so that the pointer is never actually accessed, we would still be performing performing an access check. And then if the access check fails, we'd be crashing the kernel, even though the pointer is not actually being accessed. So that would be kind of bad, and we should do that. Uh, on the other hand, if we put the access check inside this loop, um, we have a performance problem. Uh, because we'd be doing an access check for every loop iteration. Uh, so um, the way um, I've, solved, I've solved this is that um, we um, steal an idea from ARM's uh, pointer, authentication pointer authentication scheme and say, when you are verifying uh, that a pointer uh, um, is still live, instead of um, throwing an exception, like panicking, uh, if the check fails, we just return a non-canonical pointer from the check. And then if anything inside the function actually accesses the, the non-canonical pointer, um, then we get a crash. And if it's not being accessed, nothing happens. Uh, oh, and um, there's, there's like a, a small caveat with this, with this, which is that if you have a pointer that is loaded um, from memory before the pointer actually becomes valid, um, then you have issues. Um, this would be a particularly big problem if pointers could be reused. Like if you could like read a pointer from memory um, then the pointer becomes invalid, it becomes valid again, then you do some comparison to check whether it is valid, and then you access it, and then you get like a, um, a, a bogus use after free um, warning. Uh, but uh, because but with our scheme, we're never reusing these um, fat pointers. So I think this might probably be fine. Um, the current implementation has a bunch of limitations. Um, in terms of coverage, it's currently not watching anything in idle task at all, including interrupts that have an idle context. Uh, that should be relatively easily fixable, but the current prototype doesn't do it. Um, it's disabled for task struct, and it's also disabled for all constructor and RCU slabs, um, because these, um, this is like a special feature of the slab allocator, uh, where you can basically um, initialize, keep an object partially initialized across freeing and reallocation, and uh, sort of perform use of the freeze op use uh, after free access to objects after the, they've been reallocated. Um, so um, both um, for this mitigation to work for those slabs and also for things like ASAN and memory tagging to be able to work on those slabs, um, we should probably uh, provide a different implementation of these mechanisms uh, that um, work better with like memory safety instrumentation. Um, th also, the current prototype does not cover anything other than slab allocations. So it doesn't allocate, um, doesn't cover like stack use of the freeze, doesn't cover um, struct page or like pages in the linear map, like um, anonymous pages, file pages, um, vmalloc allocations. At the moment, it doesn't even ca uh, cover kmalloc large, although that should be relatively easy to fix. Um, also, um, it does not, it does not um, cover references that are coming through like IOMMU mappings, like or page tables or other things in hardware like that. It might be interesting to think about what uh, if you wanted like full 100% coverage, um, what the infrastructure for tracking this kind of references would have to look like. Um, and um, a very big limitation uh, of a partial uh, of a mitigation with partial coverage like this is that if you if you have a use of the free in an object that is covered by the mitigation. But this object has references to other things that are not covered. For example, if you have a pointer to a struct page, um, then if if you have a racing use after free style uh, issue, then uh, you could have a scenario where the object is currently being torn down, like um, the object is still considered live by the slab allocator, but you've already um, dropped uh, all of the references on the things the object is pointing to. Then at that point, some something like a struct page that you're pointing to could synchronously be freed. Um, 
and then a, a, an attacker who is racially dereferencing this page pointer could then turn this um, mitigated use of the free uh, uh, into a, like real use of the free on the struct page it points to. Um, I think that for a mitigation like this, um, it would make sense to um, to provide the programmer with some way to remove the performance impact of the mitigation if they invest sufficient uh, time into uh, writing a high quality uh, annotated code. Um, so basically, we'd um, we'd ask the programmer to uh, that to if they want their code to run faster, um, they should prove to the compiler that the, that certain aspects of the locking um, uh, and such are correct, like lock balancing, and that certain members of structures are protected by locks and so on. Um, uh, and then that would allow us to um, not check certain things in our use of free mitigation. So you, one way you can kind of think about this is uh, we need mitigations like this to make C code fast. Um, on the other hand, we don't need mitigations like this to make Rust code, for example, fast. But if we don't want to invest the time to rewrite all of our code in something like Rust, maybe it would be cool to figure out whether we can have like a sliding spectrum between C and Rust, where the more like Rusty you make your code by putting annotations on it and stuff, um, the less impact the memory safety mitigation needs to have. But I don't have like any concrete plans for, or anything for this stuff, just like very hand wavy. Um, okay, um, so let's get to the terrible, terrible performance numbers. And for this, I'm going to have to switch over to live presentation stuff because uh, I didn't have those ready by the time um, the slides were due. Um, so uh, let's look at memory overhead first. Um, I tested this on a machine with eight gigabytes of RAM, um, and I mostly filled the memory with like file system cache stuff. Um, and you can see at the bottom uh, of the slide that most of the memory was used for like, that most of the allocations were like dentries and buffer heads and inodes and stuff like that. Um, so the, the total amount of slab memory usage here was around 380 megabytes, and uh, the mitigation was using something like 17 megabytes uh, for its metadata. And so the overhead relative to the um, memory used by slab objects uh, was something like 4.4%. Um, the overhead relative to the total memory of the system was only something like 0.2%, but you could argue that that number is kind of cheating because it uh, counts a physical memory that's not actually covered by the mitigation. So uh, yeah, maybe like 4% is more like the real um, performance overhead number here. Uh, anyway, it's not, not too terrible. Um, now get into let's get into C, uh, CPU overhead. Now CPU overhead really depends on what you measure, of course. So let's start off with a truly terrible benchmark, uh, which is um, building the kernel. Um, I, I, I did this with like a tiny config and make uh, with uh, as much parallelism as I have cores on the machine and hot VFS caches. Uh, and there, um, with like full, with, with the mitigation fully enabled, I got something like eight percent CPU overhead. Um, so. Maybe that's not too terrible, but of course, this is a, a benchmark that is a very heavy in user space uh, uh, CPU execution. Um, now, maybe more interesting benchmark is, for example, get status, uh, because that does like a lot of um, kernel heavy uh, stuff, um, but it still doesn't have like a lot of IPC uh, and doesn't do many kernel allocations and stuff. Um, so there, um, I got um, something like 40% overhead uh, when just testing uh the with all of the infrastructure enabled but without but with uh but uh, without actually um handing um letting the slab allocator hand memory over uh, into the uh, mitigation uh, stuff so all of the pointers were still unencoded um and um, none of the delayed frame was happening um and with the mitigation fully enabled i got like 60 percent cpu overhead which is not great um but uh we can do worse um, so if we have a like producer consumer pattern we where we have um, a, like a micro benchmark with a Unix domain socket, one CPU is sending single byte messages to it, the other CPU is consuming them. Um, and we have, uh, and then we are very much exercising this like global freeing machinery. Um, uh, and uh, we get terrible cache locality and um, partly because the global freeing stuff uh, is um, reducing, uh, uh, is, is worsening cache, cache locality by itself, partly because our metadata, we have packs like metadata for four objects into a single cache line. So we're going to get cache line contention on this metadata. Uh, and with this, I got like 160% CPU overhead, which is really uh, a bit small. Um, yeah, 
So um, I think that in conclusion, the memory overhead for this kind of thing is not really a big problem, but CPU overhead is like really hard. Uh, it's, it's really problematic uh, unless you're just running something that just has no, um, that, that is very um, user space heavy. Um, and I think that lowering the CPU overhead to something that's like more reasonable would probably require a lot of more like lifetime annotations and such things on common code. Um, all right. Uh, so with that, um, uh, here's some links uh, to the code that I just uploaded. Um, and now I guess it's time for questions. Um, um, okay. Um, I don't have a lot of questions. Um, uh, someone asked, um, what is the kernel config option for structural optimization? Um, uh, uh, I have no idea, but I can look it up. Um, ECC underscore plugin underscore rent struct does that. Um, okay. Uh, Someone asked, uh, am, am I planning to upstream this? That's a very good question. So um, I think it would be great if we could have something like this upstream. But at the same time, I'm aware that uh, at the moment, the performance impact of this is probably uh, not really something many people would want to deal with. So I think that before upstreaming something like this, it would be necessary uh, to at least make some small steps uh, in the direction of providing annotations that let you reduce the performance impact of the stuff to some degree and then apply those annotations in some of the more performance critical parts of the kernel, like um, maybe some sub, maybe some parts of the VFS um, or stuff like that um, to, to, to make it more likely that people will actually turn something like this on. Um, yeah, so at the moment I've, I've tested it in like two MU and I've tested it on a physical um, AMD workstation, which is where I've tested it on. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I wouldn't recommend running this like on your server in production or anything like that at this point. Um, uh, yeah, um, someone asked, um, how does this play with uh, subsystems that use extra bits and pointers for internal tagging? So that should work fine because um, like other mitigations like memory taking already use these um, upper bits in the pointers. Um, and the, um, yeah, some, mitiga uh, some mitigations already use these upper bits in the pointers. Um, and like anything that uh, like accelerates that puts extra bits in, that uses um, pointer bits for other purposes normally puts these like extra bits in the lower part of the pointer. Um, and all of the um, fat pointers that I'm returning have like a non, have an offset in the low 16 bits. Um, so they're actually more aligned than native pointers. Um, so that should be fine. Um, someone's asking whether I would um, want to discuss this at the Connell Summit to uh, come up with solutions. Uh, um, maybe. Um, 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 I don't want to commit to anything at this point. Um, I've been working on this for, for some time now, so I think uh, in the, the foreseeable future, I'll probably be working on some different stuff for now. Um, uh, someone's asking whether this interacts, how this interacts with like slab debugging. Um, so that's, I, I think it shouldn't interact with it too badly. Like basically the mitigation is kind of uh, uh, glued as a layer in between the normal, um, between like the normal slab functionality and, um, um, uh, and like the, 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 the API that um, kernel code uses to interact with slab. Uh, so, um, when you when you make an allocation, you go through the normal slab machinery, uh, and then at the end, uh, just before the pointer get almost like just before the pointer gets returned, uh, we um, turn into a fat pointer and uh, a register with the mitigation that the pointer is now allocated and stuff. Um, and when you free a pointer, we basically redirect from K3 or whatever you're calling uh, over into the mitigation machinery, 
Uh, and then after the mitigation machinery is done and says, okay, the pointer is unused now, uh, only then we actually put it back into the slab machinery. Um, so it, it it should mostly work fine with slab debugging, except that um, one thing that currently doesn't work is that uh, slab has a feature where it will save the stack traces when you're allocating and um, freeing things. Um, and with this mitigation, the allocation stack trace would still look the right way, but the um, um, freeing stack trace would just point into the um, a mitigation machinery and not uh, to the place where the actual freeing happened. Um, uh, someone's asking whether I'm talking about um, sparse annotations or um, something different here. Um, I, th I think you'd need annotations that are slightly more complicated than what sparse provides at the moment. Uh, so sparse provides some locking, lock balancing uh, annotations and does some level of verification on those. Um, so you'd, you'd need annotations like that, but you'd also need annotations, for example, on structure members that say um, which locks protect these um, structure members. I think uh, Clang has some uh, annotations uh, like this for some basic locking verification already. Um, so it might make sense to port something like that over to the kernel, but um, that's a somewhat um, basic uh, level of verification that uh, isn't, I think, that I think isn't really designed for things where you, for example, can access a pointer either through RCU or under a mutex, or and where like um, where you have like um, more complicated looking scenarios like that. Um, and someone's asking whether I've measured how much of the CPU impact actually came from like extra CPU operations or like um, cache misses and TLB misses and stuff. Um, uh, I don't really have precise numbers on that, but um, uh, in the performance slides I showed earlier, um, you could see that if that like if I didn't actually um, fully turn on the mitigation such that um, all of the pointers that were fl flying around the corner were actually still raw pointers, I still got like 40% or something like performance impact already compared to like 60% with the mitigation fully enabled. So um, clearly like this first 40% are not attributable to like um, uh, uh, like uh, TLB uh, 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 to like cache misses or anything like that. Um, um, Yeah, someone's asking what I think about um, using these like cleanup attributes that GCC and Clang provide that let you kind of do things that look kind of like um, C++ destructors where you get an automatic function invocation when a function, uh, when a function returns or when something goes out of scope. Um, I, th I think in like user space application code, that's certainly very nice to have uh, because uh, it lets you avoid coding extra um, uh, um, error handling paths and stuff. Um, I'm not I'm not entirely sure how I feel about doing something like this in the kernel because um, it's 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 a good fit if you just have some cleanup operations like freeing some stuff uh, or whatever that can just happen at any point. Uh, but if you have cleanup operations that um, require you to still be holding some lock or something like that, it gets more complicated. Like basically if if any of the cleanup steps you're doing have interdependencies and can't just be reordered arbitrarily. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure whether maybe you risk the compiler just randomly deciding to uh, at some point put these in a different order and maybe break things that way. So like um, I'd be kind of cautious about doing that. Um, uh, Someone asked what would be other examples of annotations that would be useful. So um, n not really a, an annotation about memory safety, but an annotation that would be kind of helpful, for example, mm, for, for mitigation might, for example, be an annotation on um, uh, on a on a pointer that says this point is only rarely written um, and we don't and um, it doesn't matter how much storage we're using to store this pointer. Um, so you can, and, and we're only accessing this pointer under a lock, so you are allowed to, so the compiler is allowed to duplicate the pointer and then have like um, the, the, the fat pointer stored alongside the already decoded raw pointer. And then the compiler um, could maybe uh, um, use that so that it can avoid doing the extra decoding step um, when it reads the pointer and knows that it's just going to use this pointer. 
um, for um, like direct memory access and stuff without handing the pointer off to uh, anywhere else. Um, so that might be like a like useful um, if if you if you're not if you if you don't uh, if if you're not able to provide annotations that let uh, you remove the instrumentation overhead completely. Um, uh, all right. Um, I think we can wrap it up. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, bye.